to have you here uh, at the Rapid City Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have a couple announcements for you. So first I'll have Jamie come up, followed by Stephanie. Okay. Um, Happy Sabbath. I just wanted to invite everyone to our school social studies fair Thursday night at 6 o'clock. The students have been working hard on their boards. We're doing the Caribbean and North America this year. Um, So we are also doing a game show like we did last year. So be prepared to maybe be called up to answer some questions. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We're also having a small kindergarten graduation for our three kindergartners that night. And um, we are looking for a couple people to possibly donate some fruit trays or veggie trays. And if you're willing to help with that, please talk to Linda Mount. Thanks. I am reminding everybody that we have Mother's Day tea tomorrow afternoon at 2 and come and enjoy and we'll have a great time together. I also kind of wanted to plant the seed that we're going to have a baby shower on Father's Day weekend kind of with the men's group that's going to have breakfast. And that baby shower, we're going to collect some stuff. We're going to make diaper bags um, that will support foster families in our area. And so the idea is that we'll get all the stuff together, then we'll pack the diaper bags and we'll drop them off at the foster family closet. So just kind of start thinking about it. I'll put a list into the bulletin next week so people will kind of know what what things are needed and wanted and what we're going to need for all the bags. So think about those things. And then primary Sabbath school class. The kids make cupcakes for their moms but they're frosted and we didn't want them running through here. So if you'll stop in the primary room to pick them up after, we will greatly appreciate it. All right. And then one final announcement. So a lot of you in the email that I sent out a a little while ago uh, with the newsletter included a link to a survey that you were invited to fill out uh, regarding the, the changes and modifications we've made to our church service. Uh, worship service that starts at 11. So if you don't have a computer or if you haven't filled out the survey, we do have paper copies that we are able to hand out to you right now. If you haven't had a chance, raise your hand. All right, and as they're finishing up that, I will have uh, our Sabbath candle reading, and Layla will be lighting our Sabbath candle for this morning. It's about Mother's Day. Come gently lay your head upon my chest, and I will comfort you like a mother while you rest. The tide can change so fast, but I will stay. The same through the past, the same in the future, the same today. I am constant. I am near. I am peace that shatters all your secret fears. I've known you through and through. There's no need to hide. I want to show you love that is deep and high and wide. These words are from a song called I Am by Jill Phillips. It's written from the viewpoint of God speaking to his children. And as we light the Sabbath candle today, imagine God speaking these words just to you. Let the words speak to any chaos or fear that are in your life and allow his peace to bring rest to your heart. Amen. Please bow your heads with me as we open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Sabbath day. We thank you for the mothers in our lives and the women who have shaped us and molded us through our our lives. We uh, we ask you be with our our service today. Be with us in this presence and uh, may you move and and shake in our lives that. Uh, we may more reflect you and reflect your message to the world around us. Please be with us this day and throughout this week. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Time to invite the children up for our uh, children's story. So if you are young at heart or young in age, we invite you to come forward. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Today I wanted to talk about... um, how God made many, many wonderful things. Um, At creation, he made male and female, and we were fearfully and wonderfully made, and a lot of wonderful animals, right? But today, we're gonna talk about mamas and the power that God gave them. 
Um, so we brought some pictures. See how my belly grew? Really, really big. Um, so God gave us that power to grow babies in our belly. And I didn't have to do anything other than eat normal, right? And it grew on its own. Um, there was no timer. Or I couldn't fast forward it or pause it. It just kind of happened. And then here's on the day that we went to have our first baby. Um, as you can see, it was pretty scary. Um, and again, once the baby, oh, there's, there's those, the fathers are really important too. Very good. <laughs> They're good people too. There's the father very relaxed. Um, and again, after you have the babies, you know, your body makes milk. And again, I didn't have to push any button or drink anything special to, you know, any kind of milk mix for babies, right? My body just made it. God created it that way. Some people, some mamas have multiple babies, which is kind of neat, right? And a lot of work. And like I was able to have three, thank God. Um, and people have uh, a lot of babies. Uh, Mr. Lopez, his grandma had 14 kids, right? So what kind of power did God give that body to have 14 babies, right? And then gives us the strength to get up in the, to be up all night, a lot of the part of the night, and then still be able to kind of function in the morning. So again, that's God's powers. Um, and uh, I've looked at some animals in, um, James, can you switch it up? Oh, so look at these beautiful animals, right? So these are the African elephants. Um, and they live in a matri matriarchal society. So the females are kind of in charge there. And they help out the baby calves. And when the baby is born, you know, the other mothers in the group help out the, the mamas, right? So it's nice to see that they have helping a helping hand. And the females are so affectionate with their babies. Look at how cute those are, right? And then um, another awesome creature that God made is the orangutan. And I just thought this was so cute. Kind of, yeah. It's um, And so the bond between the orangutan mother and their young is the strongest in nature. And that just makes me think of my mama that I miss very much. Um, and they take care of the baby, just like a kind of like a human mama, they take care of their babies and uh, feed them and transport them everywhere with them for about two years. And they teach them where to find food, um, how to build a building nest, or I'm sorry, a sleeping nest, right? Because they have to sleep and they show them. So you guys learn a lot. In the Bible, it talks about, you know, um, honoring your father and mother, right? So here the mothers are guiding them and telling them what to eat and to make their days long. And look at that one, so cute, kissing. And one of the um, special things that I uh, thought about these orangutans, um, the female orangutans are known to visit their mothers until they reach the age of 15 and 16. So please, people, call your mother. Um, <laughs> go visit her. And again, just such a blessing that God has given us um, these wonderful mothers and the blessing to be a mother. So uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all of these mothers. We ask that you please guide them and bless them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then um, Mia and Eva have some little stickers, elephant stickers, and a little monkey ape stickers. Eva, start this back up, go this way. And then also to uh, show our love and support for these wonderful ladies that we have in our church, the children, once you get your sticker, we'll go over here to Miss Kelly, and we are going to pass out um, flowers to all of the ladies in the church. So thank you. This is our offering for today. It's ADRA Disaster Relief. As we approach Christ's return, the Bible tells us that crisis events will increase around the world. Emergency management officials who have tracked disasters over 50 years confirm that tornadoes are touching down with a greater impact. Hurricanes are moving at greater speeds and mass shootings continue to affect our communities on a regular basis. The Seventh-day Adventist Church serves those affected by these types of disaster or devastating effects. Adventist Community Service responds throughout 
North American Division, volunteers open collection centers to support those whose homes have been destroyed, support communities that have been struck by senseless shootings with emotional, spiritual care teams, and deliver supplies to areas of greatest need in the aftermath of the disaster. Your offering this Sabbath will ensure ACS is able to prepare, respond, and work in recovery efforts that take place within the North American Division, which includes the United States, Canada, Bermuda, Guam, and Micronesia. While ACS is responsible for these areas, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has not forgotten the rest of the world. It has another humanitarian organization that responds to events outside of the North American Division called ADRA, Adventist Development and Relief, Associ Relief, Relief Association. Please give, this ad please give this Sabbath to the Disaster and Famine Relief Offering where your donation will support both ACS and ADRA. We look forward to continuing our work to serve communities in Christ's name. And the offering boxes are in the back, and there'll be a uh, deacon in back to collect also. Thanks. That my mom is a doctor that whenever we're sick, she can heal us. She's kind. That she's so loving and caring about me. That she's always there for me. She hangs out with me and she's a good cook. That she loves me. Cookie. That she takes care of me and loves me. It would be for her doctoring, her good doctoring. My mom would become famous for drawing because she's a really good drawer. For her to love me. For how she, good she takes care of me. Singing. Nursing. My mom would be famous for cooking. She's good at things. My mom's good at numbers. At numbers? Yep. She always tells me to listen up. Good night. To never give up at drawing. Clean up the kitchen. She says I love you and she says go clean your room. And she loves me. Um, clean up, get my laundry basket to bring her it. That she loves me. She lets me have bubble gum from her office and ice cream. Because she's kind. The way she shows her love is by cooking for people that she loves. Because she takes me shopping. Because she shows it and she makes her little stores. Because she, she loves me very much. Is because she takes care of me. She takes care of me and she tells me. Trust. She is 47 or 48. Mom's age, she's 6, 19, and 20. Do you know, not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, so you were brought, bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and happy pre-Mother's Day to all the mothers. Let us get ready for worshiping in song. The words will be on the screen, so if you do not know, you can go ahead and follow as we sing. Mm -hmm. 
I'd just like to say as we go throughout the service today, just remember that God is here with us. And so just focus on him, concentrate on him, and we will receive our blessing. sing the new theme song save your attention okay so this is this is the theme song for may my god is all i need which is a modern day hymn and the bridge to it is in the cradle roll theme song all right so remember we've got to have our god is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do okay so get ready to do those actions please stand with us as we sing my god is all i need dark dark is the valley Faint the light at my feet, but whatever may face me, my God is all I need. Right. My brighter the treasures life may offer to me. my strength when I cannot go on peace when all my power's gone hope although the night is long and deep is my song 
for he has rescued me. Joy, now he has set me free. Praise, praise to my Father be. My God is all I need. God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His and He would too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His, and He work too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Nothing my God cannot do. He is my strength when I cannot go on. He's when all my power's gone. Hope although the night is long and deep. He is my song for he has rescued me. Joy now he has set me free. Praise, praise to my Father be, my God is all I need. Praise, praise to my Father be, my God is all I need. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, and please be with all the requests that are in this box. Um, please help them, you know what they are, and help them and be with them, God, and please be with everybody here in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. That was really, really good. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, we uh, ask you'll speak now and that you will open the ears of our hearts and more importantly, open the doors to our hearts and uh, uh, allow us to take in the word and listen to what you have to tell us today. Amen. When I was asked to give this talk, I, uh, I had two options. Well, I kind of had one option. I was told either communication or health. And so I was kind of told it had to be on health. So, 
It's going to be on health. And um, for those of you who don't know, I, um, I'm a physician, and I, I deal with health every day, which is probably one of the reasons why I was asked to talk on this. And health is, uh, it's hard. I'll be the first to say this. Um, you know, there's a lot that we see in our world today that doesn't exactly portend good health to anyone. And becoming one who uh, helps people with their health, the tr medical training process is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. I just want to talk a little bit about kind of what it took for me to kind of become a become a doc and it's uh people ask me about that and i tell them imagine every wonderful memory you had in your 20s and eliminate about 95 percent of them and then at the age of 21 assume a quarter million dollars worth of debt move across the country live by yourself study literally from morning to night 12 hours, four hours for school. They only had school for four hours because the expectation was is you'd spend the rest of the six to eight studying. And uh, which is probably why they haven't made a lot of movies about medical school because you would it would basically you know, be the screenshot of the back of someone's head hunched over a table in a library. And that's the, that's the reality of it. And then once you do the two years of, of testing, um, you have to do on-the-job work where you basically are kind of taught the art of caring for people. And that involves anywhere between 80 and 100 hours every week in a hospital, waking up anywhere between 3 and 4 a.m., driving to the hospital, getting quizzed throughout the day. It's actually called, the colloquialism is pimping where you'd be asked point, ba point blank questions about what are the branches of the brachial plexus, or what are the side effects of acetazolamide, or what is the least likely problem with this person. And then of course, when you answer incorrectly, which everyone invariably does, you don't forget it, and the attending doesn't make you forget it um, in probably less kind ways than we'd like. You do that, and then you start practice. Um, it's hard. It's, uh, it's, it's oftentimes equated to going into some sort of traumatic experience, which is probably why the bonds between our medical students are pretty strong because of a, of a shared grief, a shared torture. And uh, that's kind of how we get through it. And then we have to face the real world of health today. Um, and that's hard because the moment you actually stop medical training is the moment when you actually start learning how to deal with people and how to deal with the medical world. And so in practice, we deal with the breadth of humanity. We meet with, on a daily basis, every type of socioeconomic status, every type of race, every type of personality type, every per type of coping mechanism, every type of opinion about the person sitting in front of you, every type of prejudice, every type of political party, every type of sexual orientation. And you have to look at every individual as if they bear the face of God and treat them accordingly. So today's scripture is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Whom you have from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So how do you stay healthy in uh, 2024 United States? <clears throat> it's like, it's like telling or not to be wet. Most of the things we eat comes in a plastic bag. We walk nowhere. We drive a car anywhere. Actually, fun fact, did you know that you spend t on average 22,000 minutes a year in your car? 
We don't walk you. That's 15 days or so, give or take. You sit for transportation. Food quality is poor. We don't know where our food comes from. We have a general idea. It's printed on the package, but we didn't make it. We didn't grow it. Exercise is forced and unnatural. We actually have to drive in our cars to go to a gym to exercise and get in the car and drive back. Our sleep quality is abysmal. We have a very fragmented domestic social circle. Our dinner times are not taken together in a lot of circumstances. We don't spend time with friends. We don't spend time with the loved ones, the people that kind of color the fabric of our lives. We don't get to spend time with them. And basically from the time you finish formative medical or former training or education all the way until your 60s or 70s, you work. You show up at a job. You sit at a desk most cases. Or you perform a job that does the opposite and it commits you to so much abuses on your body that your latter years are ones of discomfort and pain and limited mobility. So this, the world we live in is not curated for a healthy lifestyle. Now, most of you are familiar with the concept of the Adventist health message. Um, it's basic, based on the tenets of the Bible, our treatment of how we treat ourselves, the, the sanctuary that God has uh, entrusted to us, how we care for that. And Ellen White has written about this as well in Ministries of Healing. Um, there's been a lot of studies about Adventist health. You may have heard of what's called the Adventist Health Study. Uh, these are very, well, two iterations of it that have happened for first since 1974, and then uh, in 2002. These are long uh, longitudinal studies where we actually look at Adventist lifestyle, diets, habits, and we look at more a lot of different variables, you know, mortality, cardiovascular health, you know, mood, rates of depression and mental health and so forth. And it's a scientifically proven fact that following these Adventist health principles extends lives, extends lives. Um, and it actually can do a lot of other, not only extends our lives, but improves the quality of our lives. It actually can cut the risk of cardiovascular disease by a third, cuts your risk of cancers by half, so there's proof to this, but what does the Adventist health message mean in the world today? Now, there is actually, and this is probably for the better, this has caught on. This idea of healthy living actually has caught on, and it's not infrequent that we run into uh, other people that promote healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, you know, uh, vegetarianism, staying active, the tenets that we have held true to what's core in the Adventist health message is much more commonplace now than they were 30, 40 years ago. And especially since the, uh, since the time of Ellen White. Um, vegetarianism, veganism has become much more commonplace. We, f we are a much more aware of the impact of our life, lifestyle on our body. Even the concept of Sabbath, you know, we used to hold a monopoly on Sabbath. We used to think that's us. We are Sabbath keepers. But the rest of the world is actually picking up on that. They're like, oh, it's actually healthy to take a day and spend time, rest, sit, play, do what you want for yourself. And that's, uh, that's actually kind of a, a, an amazing thing. And... Um, They've even done other documentaries about this. You may have heard of uh, Dan Buettner's documentary series. He's, a, he's an author who's also produced a couple of documentaries about this. Uh, you may have heard of Live to 100, which is on Netflix, by the way. It's very interesting. If you have a chance or if you have a subscription, you should check it out. They actually look at the blue zones, which are areas around the world where people live abnormally long lives. Loma Linda is one of them. And there's a number of other sites they talk about. So it's, these principles are catching on. There's even a board certification that is called the American, College of Li or American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. So it's 
it's, it's accepted. But these things focus on, thi like a lot of what we've learned about health and what impacts health goes beyond what the original Adventist health message actually speaks about. And it's alluded to in a lot of Ellen G. White writings, you know, the principles of Sabbath and community and so forth. And often to, in, in our circles, in our Adventist world, we, it's always typically revolved around diet, typically revolved around fresh air and exercise. But I dare say that there are other elements to health that we also as Adventists, owe to ourselves to pay attention to. So that's where I kind of came up with the idea of Adventist Health Message 2.0 for the modern era. You know, times have changed. This isn't 1909 anymore, or 1904, I think it was. This is the new world. This is where the issues and things that we face nowadays are markedly different than what they did from before. So I want to talk about a few pieces of health that we probably need to be more attentive to uh, nowadays. And one of the things I do want to first hit on is our social interaction. Social interaction. So we are increasingly becoming more isolated. Even Kelly and I were talking on the way this morning how our entire world is so siloed. You start in your home. You get in your car by yourself. You drive to your cubicle. You work at your cubicle. Get in your car and drive home, and you don't interact with anybody. And it's a real problem. And actually, they've done research into this that loneliness and social isolation can actually increase the risk of heart disease by 29% and increase your dementia risks by 50%. Being socially isolated does this. And in fact, um, Vivek Murthy, who was a uh, physician, is former Surgeon General of the United States, he said that essentially social isolation is the more, has the mortality equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So uh, we, we harp on people a lot for smoking, but how often do we harp on people for not getting out and spending time and having fun and socializing? You know, it's, it's kind of eye-opening, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's tragic. It's tragic. Over 30% of the United States are considered lonely, self-described lonely. Uh, those at greater risk are low-income adults, young adults, older adults, adults living alone, uh, LGBTQ plus individuals, people with chronic diseases, di uh, disabilities, and immigrants. How often do we think of these people as people that maybe what for their health we should reach out? Do we reach these people, the marginalized? How do we treat these people? You know, the Bible says in Matthew, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. And then you could also rephrase that, and whatever you don't do to the least of these, you don't do for me. Um, so I think that's, that's a big piece, and kind of woke me up when I found these statistics. And if we profess to have a health message worth sharing, perhaps we take that more seriously. Maybe it just takes vulnerability on our part to reach out to an individual who may feel marginalized. So social inter interaction. Uh, one of the second things I want to talk about is uh, stress management. Now, <coughs> stress is it's, it's part of our, it's, it's in the fabric of life. It's, it is what it is, and we're going to encounter problems and stressful occurrences. That's not a problem. And that's not certainly, you know, a finger pointing habit of just say, don't be stressed. You know, again, that's not useful. That's not helpful. Stress is 
plays out in our world in a lot of different ways. And John Maxwell, who wrote the book Leadership, he's written a lot about that, kind of described these characteristics that uh, uh, are of people that are stress-prone, people that are prone to stress. And this is just a short, not exhaustive list. They plan the day unrealistically. They are the first to arrive. They are the last to leave. They are always in a hurry. They make no plans for relaxation. Let me repeat that. They make no plans for relaxation. <laughs> they feel guilty about doing anything other than work. Ooh. They see unforeseen problems as setbacks or disasters is always thinking about several other things when working, and they feel the need to be recognized, and they overextend themselves because of this. So some of us probably match on this list. I know I match a couple of these, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a problem that we need to recognize. And stress is coupled with its kissing cousin, anxiety. Anxiety as well is a, a, a huge problem in our, in our world. Over 42 million Americans have been diagnosed with clinical anxiety. Now, we have the blessing to be on this side of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm glad that's done. But those numbers have only worsened since then. Compared to pre-COVID numbers and post-COVID numbers, the incidence of anxiety has increased about 23%, and the incidence of depression has increased approximately 25%. And stress, as you can imagine, is not always good for the body. Sometimes it is. You stress or good stress. These are stressors that allow us to become adaptable and flexible and Resilience. These are good stressors to have in our lives, but there's also a lot of negative effects to having stress and anxiety that are detrimental. And that's on a physiologic basis. That's just not just the psychologic basis of the way that it affects your body. Your body is structured in a what's called a fight or flight uh, regimen. You basically are created in a way to survive bad things that happen to you. And the way you do that is by increasing various hormones in the body, increasing blood pressure and heart rates and so forth. And those things are critical, life-saving. But if you're in that state all the time, if you're always in a state of fear, of heightened alertness, of, of anxiety, that is detrimental. It leads to higher blood pressures, more vascular inflammation and heart attacks and so forth. It affects heart, brain, kidneys, endocrine organs, diet, weight, energy, mood, all these things. And one of the blessings that we have is Adventism is Sabbath. And Sabbath, you know, it's one of those principles that, you know, we've always been taught it at a young age. We've always, you know, if you have grown up with in the, in the church and you've experienced it your entire life, you've known nothing but Sabbath, and you've kind of taken it for granted. But you meet an individual who may have Sabbath as a new concept for them, and they'll tell you, I, it's a totally different world to actually have a day to just literally sit and rest. And that is one of the, one of the greatest methods that we have of combating anxiety and stress in our lives. There's, you know, we have the opportunity for more recreation. It's less regimented. We get outside more. And some, and in my personal favorite, it allows you time in silence. We don't like silence. I know. I, I've been in this church service enough that we, we, we don't like silence. We don't like it when it's quiet. And we're like, what's supposed to be going on up, up there? It's like, oh, someone's announcing. We really don't like silence. And it's been told that we don't like silence because it forces us to confront ourselves. It forces us to rationalize with who we are 
and understand ourselves more and to have conversations with ourselves that we don't often have when we're surrounded by noise or TVs or coworkers or other things. So stress management, very, very important. I did want to also briefly talk about a, a fourth issue called workism. Workism is actually a, a term that was coined recently by a sociologist, I can't remember the name, I've read a whole bunch of his books, but it's basically the concept that we as Americans, as a modern day society, have found our moral construct, our moral rightness to be that, which in, that within the framework of employment, of doing a job. In other words, we find it morally correct to be at work. And that's not a, that's not a bad thing, you know, inherently. You know, work is good. Work is necessary. That's, you know, God gave us hands to work with. God gave us feet to travel. There are, obviously, you know, this is, this is the, the world that we live in, and it runs on, on people doing work. I'm not saying don't work, and I'm not bashing work. I'm bashing worshiping work. When it becomes our identity, when it becomes who we are, when it, you know, you run into somebody and you run into them at a party or Christmas or whatever, and what's the first question you ask a stranger? What do you do? How's work? Those are nice fillers because it makes you sound interested. It's like, oh, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an engineer. It's like, oh, well, you know, I you know, work for an accounting firm or whatever it is. And that's our, that becomes our identity. That becomes our idol, dare I say. So, and that's, you know, and, and especially in the Western world, that's, that's become commonplace. You run into people like that. You run into people out there and in here that, that have that reality for themselves of, and, and, and it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a slight against them. It's not a slight against anybody who is committed to work because some jobs actually require a fair amount of commitment. I know. <laughs> and a lot of financial commitment, too. But, <clears throat> but we have to really be cautious about who we are and what we do because those are mutually exclusive things. So workism. A lot you can read about it online. Um, very interesting topic. And one of the last things I want to talk about is something that is a phenomenon that is kind of unique to this generation. It's never been seen before. It's never been dealt before. No one has really seen anything cause as much trouble because of it. Not everybody really has a good solution for it. And it's going to be with us for the remainder of our days. And that is social media. Social media. Now, this is, again, is not a harp on it. But I will say it is a reality of our world that we are forced to grapple with. And its, and its consequences. And I would say it's and it, they've done research on this, it's been one of the most mentally destructive forces we've seen in the past 10 years. Ever since the iPhone came out in 2007, we've seen a massive increase in not only you know, uh, 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 mental health disorders, uh, other complicating factors like you know, anxiety and stress and so forth, but it's not so much that it, ha it affects adults too, but the greatest casualty is children. Children having access to the breadth of human knowledge, not only in word, but in picture and in video, in front of them at a young age. And it's, and it's a very, very touchy reality. Uh, just a few statistics that are kind of sobering. The average time spent on social media each day is three hours for people aged 16 to 24. Uh, even those who are aged 55 to 64 spend on average one hour and 46 minutes 
Uh, it can connect people. Um, but one thing to imp that's very important to recognize is that a lot of the content is not actually user generated. In other words, the things you see on a, on, on, on a screen are not necessarily created by an individual to communicate with you. Rather, it's something artificial. You know, we used to think that individuals use social media platforms. Now we find that the opposite is true. They don't view you as an individual. You are a commodity. You know, these companies, they are actually making your interaction uh, monetarily uh, uh, beneficial to them. So it used to be a... It used to be something that we used to think was great. It would connect us, and don't, don't get me wrong, it really does. We do connect with individuals. We can share experiences, pictures, interactions, and so forth, but it's changed. The clicks, the likes, the views, reels, and even the time you spend on a certain screen image is tabulated and counted and recorded to further optimize your experience. And uh, it's something that we've, we've dealt with or that we've seen create a lot more problems over the past several years. They found that back in, um, you know, 20, 2011, only 23% of teens had a, had a smartphone. Now 79% of teens have a smartphone. And actually the number is higher because that data is older. Since 2010, there has been a 134% increase in the diagnosis of anxiety in adolescents, more than a 100% increase, in other words, a doubling in the diagnosis of depression in adolescents, and there has been a 188% increase in emergency rooms visits for teenage girls for self-harm since the advent of the cell phone. Actually, there's a uh, sociologist that actually has a lot of really good books, by the way. Um, his name's Jonathan Haidt. He's written on this topic. He's researched it, and he just released a new book called The Anxious Generation. You should check it out. It's, uh, you can get it off Amazon, and they talk about this very problem. And, you know, one of the foundations of his thesis is, you know, our world used to be play-based, and now it is phone-based. We don't interact with people in the same way we used to. And in subsequent generations, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you're going to have a generation of people that never knew life without handheld internet and will interact with people as such, which is, which is terrible. So this is, this is the world today. This is our reality. But... Where does the Adventist health message come into play with something like this? You know, we, it, it, it takes very little effort to point out problems. It takes a lot of effort to point out solutions. Um, and so the short answer is, is there's really no succinct answer to any one of these things. But I do think that as us as Christians, I think we have a very unique opportunity to cater and to care for a world uh, that needs, needs God, needs Christ more than any other time in human history. So how do we, and we've been great at treating the body and, you know, you know we have this message, we have the health, we have, you know, exercise and diet, which are amazing things, but... How do we not only create healthy people, but how can we create healthy souls, healthy minds, healthy churches? One of the problems that I think we see in dealing with other people is we treat symptoms, but we don't treat problems. There's a lot of things that manifest in our lives as a result of problems, but they aren't the problems themselves. And you could take, you know, the church, for example, as a, as kind of a metaphor for this, is, you know, you see a, you see a dwindling church or something like that. You see tithe dropping. You see less interest in, in activities. Well, that's, that's not the problem. That's a symptom. 
That's a symptom of a much deeper problem. There's other issues that maybe people have personally. They have anger issues, or they have anxiety issues, or they have cut you off. They don't talk to you anymore, or maybe they talk to you too much, which can be a problem too. But that's not a, that's not a problem. That's, that's a symptom. That's them trying to tell you something's wrong. I, if I spent my career treating symptoms and not problems, I'd be sued so fast, <laughs> and I, would, I wouldn't have a job anymore. I don't treat symptoms. I treat problems. It's like that's, that's what we have to do. We can't just keep band-aiding things. We can't just keep covering things. We have to really get at the root of what's truly causing division or strife, not only in church, but in our society and in other people. One of the other ways that we need to, that we can implement these changes is we need to be real. We need to understand <coughs> where the world is. It's important that people understand where Adventism is, but we need to understand them. We need to go into their world. We need to meet them where they're at. We don't come in guns blazing with, you know, Daniel 8 in our hand and talking about 144,000 this and beasts and things. Those are, those are things that we can discuss down the road, but we, the world needs something else. The world just needs our presence. The world doesn't need those types of, you know, theological discussions. We'll save that for another day. We'll talk about that eventually because those are core tenets of Christianity and understanding what Christ has done for us. And there's beauty in that. But we need to understand people don't, people are worried about rent. People are worried about getting abused tonight. People are worried about not being able to either heat their homes or feed their kids. These are the real problems that the world really wants answers to. And that, that's, I think, a great starting point for the 2.0 Adventist health message. And then, thirdly, we need to be adaptive to changing reality. You know, there's a lot of things that could be said about tradition and the things that we hold true in terms of our Christian faith and our Christian walk. Well, if you take a look through Christian history over the past 1,500 to 2,000 years, it's changed in ways you wouldn't even imagine. There's actually a great book on this. It's uh, by Tom Holland. It's called Dominion. You should read it. It's a big book, but it basically outlines the entire breadth of Christian history since the time of Christ's death to today. And you will see that the church and the world at large has changed. It has changed in dramatic ways. And, you know, as, as a millennial, I was born in the area, era of change. I don't know anything but change. It's hard for us to sometimes understand the fact that the way that we do things today will be different than the way we do things five years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I will also say that this is not a strike against tradition because these things are important ways that we remember, important ways that we solidify our identity as Christians, as Christ followers. These are important things as well, but we also need to be aware of the fact that we need to be adaptive to a world that is changing before our eyes. And <clears throat> finally, and this may be some of the most important things that I'd say, we need to stop and listen. Sometimes the most evangelistic thing that you can do is showing up, sitting in a chair, and keeping your mouth closed. And I've discovered that, you know, and, and not just, you know, in a Christian sense, in a professional sense, you know, the two most important diagnostic instruments I use are these. Not this, not this, these. And that's something that's very, very hard for us because, again, we are scared of silence. And we have a message to tell. 
we have a message to tell. And that's critically important that we tell it. But at the same time, the first thing we should say is, tell me your story. What's, what's wrong? Like, you're hungry, let's get something to eat. Let's meet you where you're at. And I, tell, me, tell me your story. What's your viewpoint? Like, how can we begin to change someone's worldview without even understanding where it's currently at? And that's critical because when you, especially in, in my realm, when you just kind of come into a room and you start doing prescriptive work towards individuals, you tell them how things are supposed to be done. Now, there is a place for that. There is a place for that. But we need to listen. We need to sit and understand and really try to view the world through another person's eyes. And that's probably one of the most difficult thing for us to remember is that everybody else in this world, everyone else in this room has a different perspective of their world. They have different backgrounds. They have different traumas. They have different personality types, different communication methods. They have different histories. And we need to be sensitive to the fact that people are in much different places than we're at. You know, Growing up as an Adventist and going through you know, the medical training that I, I did in college and high school, and Adventist education, literally cradle to the end, has all been ensconced in this Adventist protective bubble that until I started working, uh, well, I should say you know, when I was in P Pennsylvania for fellowship, I had never viewed the world through any other lens than my own. And then I was confronted with the reality that the world views the world through a very, very different lens than my own. And understanding what it takes to cross those boundaries, to meet the other people, like that is critical. We really, really cannot afford to lose an opportunity by making people view us through our lens, instead trying to understand how they view the world through theirs. So, <clears throat> I need to close. That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll say this. So, church health and bodily health alike, it takes effort, it takes intention, and it takes the grace of a loving God to make it a reality. So our health message, it really is foundational for our faith, but we should view it perhaps in different terms. Perhaps in just the physical body, how can we use this information to treat not only our souls and our own minds, but those of the world around us? That's what the world wants. That's what the world wants. Veggie meat is great. You know, veganism is awesome. Exercise, go for it. Sleep hygiene. I, I could tell you all about sleep hygiene, by the way. But that's not what the world wants. The world wants a caring body of believers. People that will sit and listen and wrestle with the issues that they're dealing with. How can we become better in this way? How can we move beyond our usual comfort zone and reach out before, beyond these four walls and say... To everyone who bears the image of God, welcome brother, welcome sister, sit at the table. Come as you are. You are safe here. You are loved here. And that's a question I want to leave with you today. And always remember that each and every person you ever meet in your life bears the image of God. Dear Father, we... Just thank you so much for moving in our lives and loving us and uh, caring for us in ways we don't even understand. As we go from this place and go into a world that's hurting, that needs you, help us to understand our role in that. Help us to understand where you want us to be in, in that plan and just be upon us now. Give us your Sabbath blessing and bring us back safely next week. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen.